So, today's session is about transplantation immunology. Uh, basically, we'll be covering uh, the basics of how a transplant rejection reaction works and how immunology reaction basically works. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. My name is Dr. Sulesha, and I'm here from Bombay. And so, basically, what we have done at Search Test over here is basically divided the transplantation session into a variety of sub chapters. Primarily because of the reason that uh, with 20th edition Bailey and Love, uh, the transplantation section has been usually increased. As you all know, the 20th edition is just a single chapter. Now it's like four or five chapters. So with that in mind, uh, it is a good guess that maybe more chapters, more chapters, meaning more questions will be asked in the next need. Yeah. So as you all know, we have been through, Dr. Vinayak has covered the basics of how a transplant donor is selected how the organs are taken and the procurement session. We'll be dealing primarily with the immunology session. I know it's a bit boring. We'll try to make it as concise and as easy as possible. And let's hope that you guys get understand most of it. Uh, so as we have already discussed about transplant procurement, now we'll discuss about transplant immunology. The basic two sections we'll be dealing with is how a transplant rejection reaction works. How can we prevent it with the help of immunosuppressants? A basic few definitions, most of the tables and charts that I have taken up in, are either from Bailey, few from Sabiston here and there, and few from other sources, but most of them are from Bailey. So uh, can anyone quickly tell me the difference between uh, isograft, allograft, and xenograft in the chat box? Quickly. So basic question, uh, isograft, allograft, and xenograft, basic of immunology. Yeah, anyone? Someone else too, or between the difference between an uh, allograft and a xenograft. Yeah. So uh, as I must correctly replied, uh, an isograft basically means the graft is taken from someone where who has the same genetic makeup. A case in point being a sibling with the same genetic makeup, uh, twins classically. An allograft basically means that the species are different, are, are the same, sorry, but the genetic makeup can be different. Xenograft being the species are different. Similarly, heterotopic and orthotopic graft, basically meaning uh, orthotopic graft, the graft is placed in the same position and heterotopic in a different position. In classical example of heterotopic graft, anyone? Uh, we have already covered that. Heterotopic graft, yeah, kidney. So, kidney is not placed in the same location. Very good. So, this is a very basic reaction. Now, picking up the pace a little bit. The first question uh, which of the following is false regarding HLA matching? Okay. HLMA. HLA matching is done for HLA A, B, DR antigens before transplantation. HLA molecules are encoded by MHC located on 6P chromosome. For HLA matching graph score of 0, 0, 0 is better than 1, 1, 1. And HLA matching attention and confers an advantage for liver transplantation. So the following is false. Yeah. Good. Yeah. People are coming up. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So the answer is D. Yeah. So uh, HLA matching is not essential. It is better to match, when, but does not have a significant advantage for liver transplantation. Okay, so starting off with the basics, uh, we'll go MCQ by MCQ so that each topic can be covered. Uh, as described in the uh, basics, the transplant rejection reaction basically takes place on the basis of the antigens which are displaced from the graft against the antibodies in the donor. And with this, when mismatched, leads to transplant rejection in a very simplistic manner. So uh, the two major uh, antigens that we match are ABO and HLA. ABO, everyone knows, are antigens on glycoproteins, which as blood grouping is done, it matching is done. HLA is the most important antigen that, with respect to transplantation. Antigens can be a variety of types, which is through transplantation. HLA is the most important. So a basic overview about HLA. So what is HLA? So human leukocyte antigen basically basically means that there are specific group of antigens which are displaced on specific cells which can which are very pivotal in transplant immunology. So uh, there are various classes, not just class one, class two, there are class three, class four. A lot of classes are there. But when it comes to clinical relevance, the important classes are just class one and class two. So a basic about it: class one is HLA ABC, class two HLA DR DP DQ. Everyone knows that. A small point which I wanted to make by this slide is that class 1 structure includes alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3 with the beta 2 microglobin while class 2 has alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta 1 and beta 2. 
don't remember everything about it the important thing is that the peptide binding cleft that is the antigen presenting cleft in class 1 is in the alpha 1 alpha 2 junction and in class 2 is alpha 1 beta 1 junction understood yeah so again alpha 1 alpha 2 in class 1 alpha 1 beta 1 in class 2 for the antigen binding site the distribution of class 1 is all nucleated cells class 2 is just the atc that is antigen presenting cells so uh, a bit of oh, more overview about HLA. HLA is basically the antigens which are encoded by a specific gene. Now, this gene is basically MHC gene on chromosome 6 and it has a variety of locuses and it is basically transmitted as a simple genetic transmission happens. So, here is it. It is in the 6P short term of chromosome. So, the first time you add that also. So, HLA molecules are encoded by MHC located on 6P. So, the important thing is a lot of times they ask in MCQs is, is it a short arm of chromosome or the long arm of chromosome? So it is a short arm, 6P. P means the short arm. So uh, in terms of importance for transplantation, understand again, these are antigens presented on cells. Now the antigens are a variety of types, but actually DR, that class of antigens are the most important out of them. And actually DR, actually A and actually B, all three together make the tissue type. There are a variety of others. HLA A, B, C, D, R, D, P, D, Q, and so on and so forth. But for us, only three are important. As I described, the transmission is by genetic, simple genetics. So basically, one from the parent, each parent, one father and one mother, and then it transmits so on and so forth. But so how is it 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2? Three genes are calculated HLA DR, HLA A, and HLA B. All these three, when matched, and mismatched. That is how the uh, calculation happened. So the score is actually a mismatch score. So if there is a 0, 0, 0 mismatch, if there is a 0, 0, 0 mismatch, it is the best. This 2, 2, 2 mismatch is the worst. So 0, 0, 0 meaning the both in the donor and the recipient, the matching is the same for actually DR, A and B. However, this does not mean that if DR, A and B are matched, everything is well and good. There are a variety of other mechanisms by which we'll discuss which also can lead to mismatch reactions. But for us, the crux of this is there are three antigens. Matching happens at all three sites. If 0, 0, 0 is the best, 2, 2, 2 is the worst. Okay. There is another PRA. It's a very uh, newer uh, advancement given in daily in a really short way. The 20th edition has mentioned, though not mentioned the name, it has mentioned what the test is. So basically, panel reactive antibody assay basically means that uh, when we want to test compatibility, we can't go on and on again testing each recipient and each donor and mixing them, uh, the, their HLA matching can be done each and over and again. So for simplicity sakes, all those potential donors, for simplicity sakes, all those potential donors, let's say for renal transplantation are there, their blood and serum is taken, which is cross-matched against a pooled random donor cells. And the reactivity is calculated, which is a panel reactive antibody assay. If majority of them are reactive, meaning the majority of them can react with the cells, that means it's not a good thing. They can cross react. That means the more the reactivity, the worse is the outcome. So the less the reactivity, the better is the outcome. So overall, 0%, no reactivity, best outcome, 100%, very high reactivity, poor outcome. Same as 0, 0 mismatch. But the name has not been mentioned. It is there in the Sabiston book. But in Bailey, they have mentioned what it is. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just finish off the immunology part and then move to MCQ because I personally feel that immunology has taken a lesser role in the 20th edition, but a few new concepts which we are discussing over here. To emphasize, uh, most of the times MCQs are not asked directly for immunology, but the concepts are important for drugs. A few points here and there, as mentioned and discussed, we can be asked. Okay, so the first thing, uh, this is the basic outline of how the immunology reaction works. So can anyone, uh, can everyone see this thing? Yeah, so someone is asking me to explain the panel reactive antibody again. We'll explain it in the last again. Uh, it's a new topic, but I'll explain it again. It will come again in the end parts. Uh, so coming back to this topic. Uh, these are helper T cells, this is APCs, antigen presenting cells. So antigen presenting cells and helper T cells. These two interact and lead to activation of helper T cells. 
the primary activation requires two signals now you have to re 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 remember these signals because these terminology of signals were not there in the 20th edition no the 27th edition and they are there in the 20th edition so what are these signals so the first is obviously the antigen or the epitope of the donor cell which is recognized as a foreign antigen so with the mhc2 class restricted foreign antigen with the t cell receptor which basically starts the activation process that is a foreign antigen but a post stimulation is also required so the atc reacting with the helper t cells should be such that it can post stimulate the classical example only one example but the classical example is cd8086 or cd28 don't go into remembering everything just remember there are two signals one is antigen presentation that is the epitope second is post stimulation which can be a variety of types these two lead to upregulation of interleukin 2 receptors this you will have to remember why i will explain you later but remember that ultimate outcome is interleukin 2 which is the primary cytokine so a lot of times cytokines can be the primary cytokine is interleukin 2 which is the receptor which is upregulated after the activation happens as soon as the activation happens two pathways helper t cells activate killer t cells and activate b cells killer t cells basically lead to activation in a very simplistic manner of perforin and granizine which are again enzymes specific enzymes as we had lysozyme in the previous uh, years as we know what do they do they lead to apoptosis of the cell they don't lead to necrosis which is an important part we lead to apoptosis of the cell okay b cell leads to b cell activation and antibody production this is a very simplistic diagram and representation primary important thing is two signals and interleukin 2 of activation moving on after this what happens so a uh, supposedly a donor has an antigen which is directly cross reacting with the helper t cells what can happen and if this indirect thing cross reacting there is also something that has been mentioned in the new bailey which was not mentioned clearly in the old bailey so maybe a few mcs can come i'm not really sure because there's a lot of things going around this is the first pathway this is the second path both of these pathways are primarily mediated with t cells uh, nikhil adcc is basically antibody dependent cytotoxicity uh, b cell leads to antibody de dependent cytotoxicity and that is how the end reaction happens we'll talk about it a little more over here so the first diagram if you read slowly about it this is the donor dendritic cell the donor antigen presenting cells these cells basically are already having cross reactive antigens to the allo reactive cd4 cells as an indirect antigen the donor cells don't cross react directly the donor antigen the allogenic mhc basically mean the donor antigen is first processed by the recipient antigen presenting cells and then cross react with the cd4 cells understood direct recognition primarily means that the donor the graft itself had processed antigens which can directly cross react with the t cells whereas in indirect the grafted antigen which had to be processed by the recipient the recipients apcs and then cross react with cd4 ultimately the pathway is the same cd4 activates leading to as mentioned cd8 and b cell activation understood a lot of immunology i understand guys but the basic thing that you have to require, remember is that there are two pathways direct and indirect both of them lead to cd4 activation which lead to interleukin 2 upregulation that's all nothing more is required you don't need to go into the details there are a lot of cytokines given if you open sabistan and schwartz a lot of cytokines immunology and drugs are given not everything is required this is more than enough for you so now moving on after a basic understanding now i guess you must all have understood how a donor has an antigen or a processed antigen itself which is a foreign thing encoded by hla basically which again cross reacts with cd4 in starting the process of rejection reaction now moving on to rejection reactions so allograft rejection is created by which grade a oh very good most of you know that uh, it's c the bands classification uh, can anyone tell me what the latest Bands classification and when has it been uh, described? 
The original was described in 1970s, I think so. But the latest, can anyone tell me? It's not a question, won't be asked in the exams, but in which year? Does anyone know? So yeah, it's fine. So the BAM criteria has been modified a lot of time. The last being the 2019 modification. Why is it important? Because that modification, even though not directly named and mentioned in the 20th edition, has been described in extensive detail in the 20th edition as compared to the 27th edition. So basically, it is a histological criteria. Understand that it is not a clinical criteria, not a clinical pathological criteria. It is a direct histological criteria which define and grades the severity of graft rejection. Now, as we understood from immunology, the graft rejection takes place by CD4, CD8, and B cells. But what do these cells do and how does it look in histology is basically defined by BAM's criteria and which we will discuss it gradually. Uh, the important thing about it that these rejection reactions have to be picked up early because most of them are asymptomatic and are picked up by histological diagnosis as mentioned over here by either biopsy from needle, from transtubular or from any other roots depending on where the primary organ is. The important thing or what can be asked in MCQs is the cardiac route. So cardiac biopsy is commonly not obtained directly by a needle but by a transtubular endomyocardial route. Understood? So the cardiac biopsy is again taken by a transjugular endomyocardial root. The most of the other biopsies are simplistic to remember. By this biopsy and the histological outcome that comes from biopsy is defined if the rejection episode has happened or not and what type, what grade specifically. It is not a clinical criteria. It is something which most of us don't understand the first time. But as you go ahead, you realize that, that this is how it happened. And if you go in depth of BAMS classification, there's a very good classification given. Not needed for me to pursue, but for those who like to pursue transplantation. So moving on, on to types of rejection reaction. Regarding allograft rejection, which of the following is incorrect? A, hyperacute rejection occurs because of preformed antibodies. B, acute rejection is the most common cause of graft failure. C, hyperacute rejection leads to immediate graft failure. And D, acute rejection is primarily mediated by T cell. Yeah, very good. So the most common cause, cause of graft failure is not acute rejection. And someone tell me, what is it then? What's the most common cause of graft failure if, it, if this is incorrect? Excellent. Yeah, chronic. Yes, chronic. Very good, Vandana. So the most common cause of graft failure is not acute. It is a chronic graft rejection. Uh, again, the differentiation of hyperacute, acute and chronic is based on a variety of factors, including timeline. But according to recent criteria, as mentioned before, it has changed. And this is a change significantly seen in the new baby. So what is this change? We'll see. Yeah. So traditionally, it was a hyperacute, acute and chronic rejection. This is a direct table taken from the previous edition of Bailey. It's not in the new edition because it is slightly changed now. But uh, to summarize the table, uh, there are three types of rejection reaction. Again, if you understand the immunology, it is very simple to understand. The hyperacute rejection is basically based on the basis of preformed antibody. Let's say there's an ABO mismatch or some other type of antibody which was already pre-sensitized and does not need to go through the same pathway, that is CD4, CD8, B cells. But already the antibodies have been made. This is an immediate type of reaction. The important thing to remember is characterized by intravascular thrombosis. The acute rejection was said to be T cell dependent, but don't remember these things now. T cells, cell mediated, don't remember these things. I'm repeating. This is, this is an old classification. The only thing important from this table is what I have highlighted. Hyperacute rejection happens and characterized by intravascular thrombosis. Acute rejection is a reversible type of rejection. That is only out of the three, which is reversible, reversible by immunosuppressant. The chronic is the most common cause of graft failure and also has a lot of other factors apart from immune factors. So coming back to the same MCQ, Hyperacute rejection occurs because of preformed antibodies is true. Hyperacute rejection leads to immediate graft failure with extensive thrombosis is true. Acute rejection is primarily T cell mediated is partially true. 
if you transfer as a old addition the new addition makes kind of a distinction for acute rejection but the clearly wrong answer is acute rejection is the most common cause it is not the most common it is graft failure it is sorry it is a uh, chronic rejection so i will take to the take to the liberty of making a new table for you guys so a lot of things going on over here but if you guys can just remember this table I think so out of the whole lecture this is the only table that you have to remember by heart everything mentioned over here and what i have highlighted in red are definite mcq points that can come the whole lecture again repeating is not that important as this one slide is okay so coming to what the present classification means the hyperacute rejection reaction that there as it was it happens as we all can easily understand by preformed antibodies or abo incompatibility in preformed antibodies because these antibodies are already present in the recipient's body as soon as the graft comes it the rejection reaction starts this primary complement mediated leads to intravascular thrombosis and interstitial hemorrhage and happens within minutes so uh, can we really treat this injection uh, rejection reaction no we can prevent it with the help of pre testing again pra testing as someone was asking what is pra it is a panel reactive antibody assay uh, what is commonly performed nowadays before transplantation is not direct matching because that requires genetic sequencing and one to one matching but a pool matching so what's the pool a uh, random cells with a pooled blood of donors is taken including a random match of the donors this is matched against the recipient serum now if the recipient serum matches extensively with the pooled uh, antigen as present uh, with a don in, in the donors it means that reactivity in the recipient serum is very high or the uh, sensitivity is very high so if the pra test comes out as a result of higher sensitivity it means that the reactivity and the chances of rejection reaction especially hyperacute rejection reaction is extremely high in that recipient if it comes out to be low let's say it been 0 to 10% it means that the probability of cross reactivity is low and hyperacute rejection is mostly avoided then someone tell me that if the pra test comes to be highly probable meaning that the donor has a high amount of reactivity to the pooled serum can there be something to bypass that is there some method present again a potential mcq uh, again yeah yes desensitization very good yes so uh, primarily what reactivity or sensitization would have mean that most of the uh, random donors are reactive against the serum present the recipient so we what we can do is desensitization basically meaning primarily wash out the entire immune system and all the antibodies already present in the recipient serum and then take it ahead for a transplantation how is the desensitization done can someone tell me what what is used for desensitization 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 primarily means wiping out all the antibodies that are present paralyzing the whole immune system system of the recipient so how is it done yeah so someone uh, yeah abina uh, it is not anti thymocyte globulin that is a common misconception that i was asking that for desensitization the primary thing that is done is iv ig intravenous immunoglobulin anti thymocyte globulin as someone has correctly replied is for all other types of rejection it can be used for hyperacute but it is not primarily used the primary thing that is used when there is a high sensitization is iv ig intravenous immunoglobulin it washes out b cells anti thymocyte globulin washes out thymocytes t cells okay yeah moving on to the newer updates uh, acute now acute rejection is now divided into two types so acute cell mediated rejection and acute antibody mediated rejection or more scientifically termed as active antibody antibody mediated rejection so what is the difference between the two now uh, as we previously saw in previous slides uh, whenever an antigen presenting cells comes it activates the t cells that type of rejection reaction 
when T cell is activated, leading to CD8 activation, and then rejection reaction is primarily known as cell mediated rejection, which happens in the first three months and has an overall incidence of 10 to 20 percent. However, when the body already has the recipient's body already has antibodies which are there against the serum against sorry, against the antigens of the donor these are not antigens antibodies as in hyper acute antibodies these are memory b cells so these are dormant antibodies and those when activated and leads to an antibody mediated rejection is the second type so again the two types are acute cell mediated which is t cell mediated which is a more common type and acute antibody mediated in which the memory b cells the memory b cells lead to antibody production and lead to basically an outcome seen as a hyper acute rejection but not as fast in the timeline as a hyper acute because the preformed antibodies are not present the antibodies have yet to be formed but the memory b cells are there against a specific antigen so obviously the acute antibody mediated rejection is a worse type it follows the same pathway as a hyper acute rejection meaning complement activation and antibody dependent cytotoxicity as already mentioned before there is the t cell mediated leads to basically infiltration of lymphocytes and then rejection so the t cell mediated as this lymphocyte dependent can be suppressed or can be prevented with immunosuppression but antibody is very difficult to prevent the acute antibody mediated rejection is very difficult to prevent so we all understood the mechanism the timing what is seen histologically and the treatment of the prevention of hyperacute acute cell mediated acute antibody mediated the last type is chronic antibody mediated now i specifically mentioned antibody mediated because till now it was just mentioned as a chronic rejection chronic rejection re reaction is a generalized term which can include both immunological and non immunological factors and that is true when seen practically because a chronic rejection is more non immunological as an immunological however as per bams criteria the antibody mediated rejections are of two types acute and chronic and that is why i mentioned these specifically and this is how what is mentioned in the 20th edition again just the names are not specified as i am mentioning so the chronic antibody mediated rejection happens after 6 months is the most common overall leads to myotomal proliferation and fibrosis now this is because of non immunological factors more than immunological factors but overall it's classified as the same because ultimately we have to see histology so this is seen all the histology criteria for defining what type of rejection reaction, reaction is it is it a thrombosis a lymphocyte a complement deposition or myotomal proliferation and because it has chronic rejection has a combination of immunological and non immunological factors no effective treatment has been found okay yeah so uh, this is a long question for you basically a primary image based question and we have already discussed whatever the answer is here so you guys have to now quickly tell me what the answer should be so mr ravi shankar underwent a renal transplantation 5 months back due to ckd with hypertension nephropathy post operative course was uneventful and he is on maintenance immunosuppression the patient was asymptomatic however the rfts were deranged after ruling out other causes a biopsy was performed and it shows the diagram so this is basically image based question which of the following is true so again a mixed bag someone is saying b c a i see all answer a b c d okay more c is coming up okay b c so let's first decode the question this is a more ini type question rather than a neat type question as you all know neat has a lot of one liners what is it given now a lot of information has been given which can help you both deviate from the topic and uh we have clues uh someone is asking in sabiston c4d is given in hyper acute so yeah so basically uh i'll just go back to the slide again yeah 
Yeah. Uh, अभी नाम सी फोर डी इज द एंड पैथवे फॉर एनी पैथवे विच लीड्स टू कॉम्प्लीमेंट एक्टिवेशन कॉम्प्लीमेंट एक्टिवेशन क्लासिकली हैपन्स इन एंटीबॉडी मीडिएटेड रिजेक्शन सो बोथ हाइपर अक्यूट एंड अक्यूट एंटीबॉडी आर एंटीबॉडी मीडिएटेड हाउ एवर द टाइमिंग इज डिफरेंट एंड बिकॉज बिकॉज हाइपर अक्यूट इज सो फास्ट एंड सो सिवियर यू कैन सी द सी फोर डी स्टेनिंग पर फेल even though it is seen but the diagnostic criteria is mentioned in acute antibody mediated and not hyper acute hyper acute has thrombosis antibody mediated acute rejections have c4d staining specifically is it clear yeah okay so coming back to our question uh first clue is 5 months back so 5 months already rules out hyper acute so your even the c4d staining is seen it is not hyper acute it is definitely acute or chronic post operative course was even uneventful and follow up the patient was asymptomatic i want to stress the fact that most rejection reaction are asymptomatic you have to monitor the patient as it's seen over here and do a biopsy there nothing else is can be done your biopsy criteria now if you guys can't remember anything can't think of anything just I have a simple clue because this is the second, as I said, the potential important questions from the table that can come, as I mentioned. Here, as you can see, this is not an HNE staining. You can see brown stains over here. Now, brown staining is only used in terms of transplantation, at least for complement staining. And as we know, complement staining is seen in acute antibody mediated rejections. So, what is true is this is an antibody mediated rejection with. Very tubular component stained by allo antibody. I will deliberately made the option very confusing, but what you just had to see, even though you didn't read anything, was the diagram had brown staining and nothing else specifically, and it, there are already arrows over there. So the brown staining was was important, and brown staining is complement. That is all you have to remember. So the complement is seen in acute antibody mediated rejection. So most of the other options are per se right, but what is seen over here and the correlation is C. Okay. So these are all three daily images, but most likely what will be asked because it's an update is the first image which I already mentioned, antibody mediated rejection which shows C4D complement staining. If you can remember, remember C4D specifically because sometimes options can be as ridiculous as C4A, C4B, C4C, C4D. But it is C4D complement staining in the peritubular capillaries. The other two seen here are this is an acute cell mediated rejection. So I have mentioned CMR cell mediated rejection because again the classification is different. This is antibody mediated, this is cell mediated, and what I have made an arrow is. the lot of lymphocytes are seen over here and here you can see fibrosis fibrosis is seen in which type I already mentioned it is it seen in which type this is myointimal proliferation fibrosis is seen in chronic type of rejection yes very good yes so these are three images and these all three are important the most important out of them is the first one and this table these are two things i want to take out from the whole lecture not everything is important again histological intravascular thrombosis interstitial infiltrate and c4d deposition and the new names and again correlated the diagrams okay is there any aspect to immunology rejection per se and please ask yeah so actually dr dr b a or a b okay so HLA DR, then HLA A and HLA B. This is how the importance goes. Per se, but when specifying HLA matching is not that important. Whoever for whoever that was asking, it is relevant but not essential. Even in kidney, you can go ahead without the HLA. So the lower images. This image is a acute cell mediated nickel, and this is a chronic. You can see fibrosis and thickening. This is what you have to see. Sorry. Yeah, this is thickening. See, this is infiltrate. See, and this is staining. The brown color is important for you to remember. 
So the last question, rejection, reject, reaction, then we move on to drugs. I again, I made it deliberately a uh, any type of question. There are a lot of clues. The first thing mentioned over here is a 17 year old male with transplant three years ago, presented with again, the graft function with chronic rejection. During the past three years, the patient had a history of poor compliance with immunosuppression, two episodes of acute rejection reaction, but they were managed successfully with immunosuppression. The initial transplant operation had a prolonged cold shame at time. Out of all the mentioned things, it is the most important factor for acute chronic rejection. Sorry. So I see D's and B's going around. Yes. So most of them are switching to B's. So the most important is history of acute rejection episode, that is B. I mentioned specifically other points. All the other points are also important, but not everything is important. Someone mentioned C. That was a, a confusing thing. 79 year old, the age per se does not give a risk factor for chronic rejection reactions. The most important is history of acute rejection episodes. This is followed by cold shame at time, which is followed by other things like poor compliance to immunosuppressive medications, CMV rejections, reactions, and so on and so forth. But first and second are history of acute rejection episodes followed by cold shame at time during the index surgery. These are two very important things. All of these are risk factors. The most important is B. So just again to summarize, the chronic rejection reactions are the most common cause. Out of the chronic rejection also, I have specifically told the immunological reactions are antibody mediated, but the majority of the part is taken up by non-immunologic mechanisms. So non-immune mechanisms are more relevant. And so the name mentioned are specifically as per the histological outcome seen. In all these also, kidney shows normal sclerosis and tubular atrophy, pancreas, SNS, cell loss, cell loss, heart, cardiac, allograph, vasculopathy. Only these two are important. Most important being liver. In liver, the chronic rejection is quoted as vanishing bile duct syndrome. So someone can ask you what is vanishing bile duct syndrome or vanishing bile duct syndrome is seen as a what type of rejection reaction? So chronic rejection reaction. Okay. This is about chronic rejection and what are its risk factors? What are its names? Again, there is no primary treatment. The only thing is prevent the acute rejection episodes to happen when the acute stage give good immunosuppression, good follow as far as possible, early diagnosis of acute episode and treatment. The chronic rejection is still something that we have not found to prevent or treat. It will happen and most of the uh, grafts do wither with time. Okay. A small thing about graft versus post disease. It is prevalent in small bowel and liver transplant. So common, someone can tell me out of these both, why, which is more common in which organ, basically in which organ is GVHD, that is graft versus host disease, more common and why, small bowel or liver. These are the two organs in which is common, which is more. So Arun, skin manifestations are seen in GVHD. It is seen in small bowel transplant more commonly and liver second most common. What is GVHD? It is the opposite of transplant rejection episodes. In transplant rejection, the graft has donor antigens which is recognized by the cell inside the recipient and recipient mounts an immunological reaction on the donor. Here the graft has its own immunity and it mounts an immunological reaction against the recipient. And they are more common in small bowel because small bowel has a lot of lymph nodes, a lot of T cells and lymphocytes present inside of it. It's a huge organ. So GVHD is more common. And the graft which is transplanted into recipient affects the recipient and causes damage to generalized body of the recipient. And a characteristic rash seen in the hands and soles Hands and souls, if an MCQ mentions small bowel transplant, which will be mentioned after discussing small bowel transplant in the later lectures. But just to cover here, if an MCQ mentions small bowel transplant and the patient post operatively after a few days has a rash in the hands and souls, what is the diagnosis? It is craft versus host disease. Okay. Yeah.
this is all about rejection episode the types the updates the criteria and the histology moving on to what drugs i know it's a lot of things to remember in one day but and because specifically we don't need really transplant that extensively that is why we are here uh, we'll go on to drugs a very brief overview of drugs and its side effects so which of the following is not used for induction immunosuppression regimen in a transplant patient so the following is not a part of the induction immunosuppression regimen in a transplant patient a atg atg is anti thymocytic globulin as a thiopurine interleukin 2 receptor blocker and steroids excellent everyone has read the new bailey extensively so this specifically is a direct line picked up from new bailey and which which was not clearly mentioned in the old bailey however was mentioned in other books and uh, the answer here is b as a thiopurine so it all comes back again to the first few slide that everyone remembers what we saw for rejection reaction to take place you need either t cell to get activated or b cell to cross react with the antibodies both of them or either of them when happens lead to rejection reaction now we have to prevent this as already mentioned the only thing that is reversible and properly treatable and preventable is the acute episode and if we properly manage those the chronic will already be in control so in the acute stage what do we use in the initial stage what immunosuppressants are used is known as induction therapy because in the initial stage we need a tight control over the cross reactivity in immunological reaction taking place in the recipient's body against the graft so we use high dose steroids with interleukin 2 receptor blocker either these two or steroids with anti thymocytic globulin or steroids with almatozumab what are each of these we'll explain one by one but the important point is a higher dose of steroids and more potent drugs are used in maintenance we don't need such potent drugs we need drugs which can be easily taken care of with minimal reactions preferably oral drugs and so a triple regimen now this word has specifically been used a triple regimen is used which is a calcineurin inhibitor or mtor inhibitor either of them with an anti proliferative agent and a steroid don't worry we'll discuss what each of the class of drug means but this is a triple and when an episode happen even on immunosuppressant you use rescue agents rescue agents are basically either very high dose steroids or if that also do, doesn't work anti thymocytic globulin or almatozumab which is a cd52 inhibitor i know you will not understand what all of these means that is why we'll come back to this after understanding what this diagram means so this is again a direct pick up taken from very simplest thing but very useful diagram so uh, as already mentioned hyperacute rejection you have to prevent it by preventing cross matching chronic you have to prevent it by preventing acute cell mediated and acute antibody mediated rejection so how do you do that uh sorry yeah so uh, in an induction state what do you need is if the uh, graft itself has antigens or epitopes which can cross react even after matching there can be such a state and there definitely is a such a state when you cross react with the recipient serum you have to try to prevent the t cells to be activated as much as possible so you have to prevent its activation early activation is prevented that is the key step over your and as we all know for early activation in the first diagram let's see that again yeah so you and all of you see this slide for early activation i'm using this slide so for early activation you need a cross reactivity and two signals between antigen presenting cells and the helper t cells along with a co stimulation so this is the first step and the second step is interleukin 2 upregulation after interleukin 2 is upregulated the activation starts so we are already late it's already activated so we have to prevent either interleukin 2 receptor activation or this attachment to take place understood can someone please reply if uh, this is very clear because this is essential to understanding 
the sub investment drugs is this clear the first step to prevent is either attachment or activation of interleukin 2 yeah so this this is the first thing activation is prevented in the induction stage and that is essential because if activation is prevented acute rejection episode can be in control and so ultimate outcome is very good so for this to take place either you deplete the antibodies with alpha-thymocyte globin or almatozumab or you use a post-stimulatory blockade now what are these words the very very big words so as to say in simplicity atg is anti-thymocyte globin anti-thymocyte thymocyte are basically t cells so anti t cell globulin so easy to remember but it is basically anti-thymocyte globin this is a like an ivig only someone mentioned earlier but ivig has a generalized antibody sida anti-thymocyte globin is specifically depleting antibodies against the patient's own body serum so it's a pooled antibody which are injected inside the recipient leads to obliteration of all the cells the thymocytes the t cells the uh, uh, effector cells present inside the recipient's body and leads to kind of uh, paralysis of the whole immune system so with that that is used initially so that rejection doesn't happen at all obviously it has its own perks because you know, paralyze the immune system so infection is very common and so on and so forth a lot of re reactions are common but that is commonly used or you can use high dose steroid the two newer drugs which can be used are almetazumab as mentioned over here it is anti cd52 a similar thing happens don't need to go into the details similar thing lymphocytes are killed with the help of anti cd2 antibodies as almetazumab or lymphocytes are stopped from activating however ctna4 that is post stimulatory blockade the drug is balatasab has still not been clearly used in day to day routine life but the important concept to use to remember is the commonly used drug that we hear that is the calcium inhibitors anti proliferative agents are not for induction regimen it is steroid plus anti cd25 or atg or almetazumab anti cd25 sorry i forgot that anti cd25 is mentioned over here it is basically anti cd25 is anti interleukin 2 receptor blocker interleukin 2 is not receptor is not activated so the whole activation stops this is the induction regimen if activation has happened or even if a few act few cells go away from the induction regimen even if you have given good induction regimen we need a maintenance regimen so that further immuno immuno immuno, immuno rejection reaction cannot happen okay so for that three major classes are important calcium inhibitors mtor inhibitors and anti proliferative drugs we'll discuss that after a while but if you guys are clear about what induction regimen means why it uses baseliximab that is interleukin 2 receptor and high dose steroids everyone clear basic names if you can remember is fine otherwise what the regimen is is very important okay okay so this i already mentioned nd cd20 for desensitization and igig so coming to these things these three drugs there is a simplified diagram again given in bailey but in a different manner in the old bailey the simplified diagram the first class is calcium neuron inhibitors here you can see calcium neuron so what cyclosporin and tacrolimus does is inhibit this calcium neuron ultimately don't remember all the steps ultimately it goes and inhibits the signal transduction of nfat and division of cells so even though activation would have happened this division into more activated t lymphocyte would not happen by cyclosporin and tacrolimus calcium inhibitors what sirolimus mtor inhibitor so it's a different area where it acts the diagram i know it is you have to remember all these things but diagram will help sirolimus acts on mtor again ultimately acts on nfat and prevents proliferation cortex steroid acts on nfk beta again prevents proliferation azathioprine now azathioprine is one of the oldest immunosuppressants used 
it basically blocks the purine synthesis by a lot of pathways ultimately blocks the purine synthesis and again dna replication is blocked and so again the proliferation is blocked so calcineurin blockers cyclosporin tacrolimus mtor inhibitor serodimers and evolimers mtor is mammalian tor tor is used for transcription of rapamycin other name for serodimers don't confuse tacrolimus and serodimers tacrolimus and cyclosporin or calcineurin inhibitors serodimers is an mtor inhibitor okay so the primary pathway calcineurin inhibitors mtor inhibitor anti proliferative agents just as a thought okay moving on to the side effects so the following is an incorrectly matched side effect of a drug can even uh, uh, even uh, see the slide yeah okay a few b's and a few c's uh, a few more answers and i'll go ahead which of the following is incorrect is b c or even a d can give an answer a few people are giving b a few people are giving c so this is a common misconception can happen that is why i mentioned remember in which class is m or inhibitors and what are including those so what are cyclosporin and tacrolimus calcineurin inhibitors yes so now everyone is coming to b so the answer is b cyclosporin tacrolimus or calcineurin inhibitors serodimers is a mtor inhibitor the classical side effect seen with tacrolimus or cyclosporin both actually is nephrotoxicity can someone tell me what is the mediator involved leading to nephrotoxicity for these drugs which mediate nephrotoxicity is not seen in serodimers that is the answer but my question next question is nephrotoxicity is seen in calcineurin inhibitors that is serodimers and cyclosporin sorry tacrolimus and cyclosporin what causes that nephrotoxicity here we also have another calcineurin inhibitor cyclosporin which leads to gingival hyperplasia which is a true option both gingival hyperplasia and nephrotoxicity occur because of a certain mediator mediators being interleukin tnf alpha tgf beta so on and so forth can someone tell me which is the answer what is a mediator leading to gingival hyperplasia and nephrotoxicity in calcineurin inhibitors yes so it is transforming growth factor beta so what primarily happens here there is not mentioned here in this diagram is if the calcineurin inhibitor acts the calcineurin apart from this also leads to upregulation of transforming growth factor beta that inhibitor transforming growth factor beta is basically something that causes a lot of fibrosis and intimal hyperplasia after in causing chronic rejection reactions leading to thickening of the arteries then the renal vessels are infected the tgf beta leads to thickening of renal vessels leading to ultimately the graft dysfunction of the renal if the renal graft is present or per se nephrotoxicity okay so again uh, a big comprehensive list even larger lists are given in sabiston but only what i have highlighted is important not everything is remembered to be remembered the most important thing is cyclosporin and serolimus that are calcineurin inhibitors have nephrotoxicity while tacrolimus sorry while uh, mtor inhibitors for cyclosporin and tacrolimus have nephrotoxicity while mtor inhibitors do not have nephrotoxicity so when used as a triple regimen if you want to avoid nephrotoxicity which is now most of the days mtor inhibitor is used or traditionally calcineurin inhibitor is used so mtor inhibitor does not have nephrotoxicity but can lead to impaired wound healing and pneumonitis one cyclosporin because of application of tgf beta can lead to apart from nephrotoxicity hirsutism and gingival hyperplasia tacrolimus can also lead to all of those things however the tgf beta upregulation because of some reason is less so gingival hyperplasia is not seen to that extent but newer reactions that is diabetes 
a very classical MCQ for those who are appearing for INI. New onset diabetes mellitus is a complication of tacrolimus. That is an MCQ as in some way or other. So when immunosuppressants are used and tacrolimus is used, you monitor for diabetes. Tacrolimus causing diabetes mellitus, cyclosporin causing hirsutism, mTOR causing impaired bone healing. One another thing is CTLA for Ig that is palatacept can cause PTLD. However, unproven. The important is this one, two, three. Clear? Okay. Any doubts about the side effects till now? Because we'll move on to the, the common side effects if the drugs are clear. Everyone is clear about the drugs. What mechanisms are important? What slides to remember? And what ADR and side effects to remember? Okay. Okay. Good, good. Everyone is clear about it. Okay. So moving on. Last question of the day. Regarding post transplant malignancy, which of the following is incorrect? Last few five minutes, the last question of the day. Most common skin cancer seen in transplant. Common malignancy after transplantation. PTILD has a 50% overall mortality and needs aggressive immunosuppression to treat. Most of the cancers are common after transplantation, out of which the most common type is skin cancer. Which of the following is incorrect? Okay, B, B, B. B, C, B, B. Very good. That is why I put this answer because question. It's kind of a trick question. Your mind tends to think that it knows the answer, but it doesn't. More Bs, more Cs. So everyone is clear that A and D are correct at least. That's a good thing. Yeah, more answers. We'll move on. So let's go one by one. Uh, Malignancy post transplant is extremely common, primarily because of the immunosuppression. The most common type of which all are common. Most common type is SAC of the skin cancer. So the A answer, A option is right. The D option is right. Now, overall speaking, Kaposi sarcoma is an uncommon malignancy after transplantation. That is a correct statement. Yes, it, it seems counterintuitive, but the correct Incorrect statement is C. Why? C. Kaposi sarcoma is definitely a very, uh, a very uncommon thing in general and is slightly more common in post transplant patient, but still a very uncommon malignancy after transplantation. It rates very lower. Common malignancies are skin, skin, skin cancers, a lot of other cancers, then PTLD, because PTLD is also rare, even though it is commoner, but rare when you club everything. Kaposi sarcoma is the least common. In general population, it's extremely rare. It is common in only in HIV and transplant, but in transplant also trans lower. So the whole thing was made based on the fact that even though it is common, but you understand the reason, overall, it is very rare. In transplant also, it is rare, but more common than the general population. So why is it the C wrong option? PTLD does have a 50% overall mortality but does not need aggressive immunosuppression to treat. It needs, it needs immunosuppression to, what does it need? What, what is the correct thing? What do you do, need to do for immunosuppression? It needs the immunosuppression, yes. It needs the immunosuppression to reduce, very good question, yes. So again, I like to summarize thing, so this is a summary. Don't remember infections, just remember in infections that the most common viral infection is CMV and BK virus is something also very common in renal graft dysfunction. Best we can pretty much ignore the slide, but we'll discuss it in a while. The important thing is malignancy. It is overall increased for malignancy. Yes, we discussed that. Most common is skin cancer. SCC is the most common on that also. This line is to be remembered. It can be asked directly because as we all know, need likes to ask ridiculous questions and ridiculous percentages. So 50% of recipients develop skin malignancy within 20 years, 50% in 20 years. Okay. PTLD. Now PTLD, what is the full form of PTLD? Can someone tell me PTLD full form? PTLD is common in children, highly common in children, not in adults, has a very high mortality of 50%. That happens because of EBV. 
if this is present in almost everyone but once you give immunosuppression the immunity decreases and ebv reactivates yes jaydi so ptnd is post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder so post transplant as such ebv can be present in you me everyone but post transplant because of immunosuppression per se ebv reactivates leading to ptnd which can manifest as uh, uh, either uh, lymphadenitis or pneumonitis or pneumonitis a lot of things but the important thing is immunosuppression leads to reactivation so the treatment is reduction of immunosuppression and not increasing the immunosuppression that was the whole point of the mcq even though you do that the outcomes are dismal it is not very good you can give rt you can give chemo but the mortality is very high so there's nothing much you can do about it but it, if kept in mind and detected early can be prevented okay so the last point kaposi sarcoma is 300 times more common in transplant recipient as compared to general public so yes is it common in transplant recipient as compared to general public yes but is it very common in transplant recipient per se no transplant recipient out of 100 to take maybe not even 100 so the, the incidence report is around 0.1 percent so Uh, out of thousand, maybe one can develop. As compared to FCT or PTLD or even colon and breast cancer, that are very common in transplant recipients. But PTLD, although is still commoner than a normal course. Okay, so understood the difference. Three hundred times more common in transplant recipient, but overall uncommon in transplant recipients. Perfect. So. Apart from that, uh, the bacterial infections you have to give prophylaxis. TB prophylaxis is commonly given out of three. CMV prophylaxis is not given per se directly, but if happen, uh, if suspected, can be given. Screening is not done usually. BK virus again requires reducing immunosuppression and fungal anemosis candida aspergillosis. Basically, anything can happen. All infections are common, but the important thing to remember is CMV. Because it is very common and very common cause of graft rejection reactions. Okay, so any doubts with respect to uh, the ADR of drugs or with respect to the common ADRs post immunosuppression? You can ask me. But this pretty much sums up everything what uh, is given in daily as well as Ariston. You will not need to need to read and go back and read anything else. I have also included the BAMS criteria for say. Because uh, even though name is not given in this edition, it was given in the previous edition. Uh, so remember the word BAMS criteria again. Remember the new topics and uh, the new wordings which are mentioned. And uh, what is ANS? Uh, what is ANS? Navin, can you? Okay, what is the answer to the last question? Yeah. The answer to the last question basically is Kaposi sarcoma. If Uncommon after malignancy is a correct statement, but PTLD needs aggressive immunosuppression is the wrong statement because it does not need aggressive immunosuppression. It requires reduction of immunosuppression, not more immunosuppression. Understood? Uh, is that clear, Navin? Yeah. So just a second, Ajusna. Uh, so this is the induction regimen. Okay. So you need to remember. Vasiliximab is the name of interleukin two receptor blocker because that is essential. You need to remember uh, what triple agent consists of because that is essential. You also need to remember that uh, the MCQ would rightly mention induction regimen and uh, uh, maintenance therapy. Yeah. So someone is asking HLA DR. Yeah. So HLA DR. Yeah. So HLA DR is the most important immunosuppression followed by B followed by A. Yeah, that is true. Uh, I didn't get your doubt, uh, Gajendra. Yeah. Anyways, just to re-summarize, if someone has any doubt, the most important is actually DR or the actually B and actually A. Okay. Yeah, Ranjit. So PRA, PRA. I'll go back to PRA for you. So panel reactive antibody acid is basically a. It basically takes pooled. Uh, a random donor cells from a variety of mixed pool of the population is in one to one matching. Okay. Uh, sorry, Aaron, what is wrong with the term? Yeah. So, I'll explain PR, we go then whatever 
the Nick Stouts are. So PRL basically means that a uh, pooled uh, random donor cells are taken and that is matched again the prospective recipient. Instead of matching one to one, the recipient is matched and the sensitivity of the recipient serum to variety of antigens in the body in the, in the, in the pooled uh, pool is taken. And if it is highly cross reactive, meaning the recipient has a lot of antibodies which are cross reactive to the general population. So whatever donor we will choose in the future may likely have a cross reacting antibody in the recipient too. So the rejection reaction increases. That is why more the PL, PRA score, more the percentage, more meaning sensitization is happened and desensitization has to be happened. Okay. Understood? Understood PRA? The last thing, I, the first question was, yeah, so HLA, A, B, D, R, oh, I didn't get a doubt. I'll explain the histology slide. The last thing we'll do, so that is essential. Then we'll put off, close up the session. This is the histology slides. These are direct diagrams taken from the Bailey, even in this edition and the old edition, both editions have had this. Uh, this and this, both of these are acute reactions. This is acute cell mediated, this is acute antibody mediated. Acute cell mediated basically meaning that cells, CD4 cells have cross reacted and leading to rejection reaction. So here you see a lot of cells present over here that is acute cell mediated. Acute antibody mediated basically means that complement reactions take place, antibodies cross react and leading to C4D staining. That is why we see brown staining over here. And chronic rejection means myo-intimal proliferation happens and fibrosis happens. Is the slide clear? Yeah. So uh, I guess this pretty much lines up. Again, the important thing, I'll just show the last slide of this slide again because I feel that this is an important slide. Yeah. Apart from that, uh, if you have guys have any doubt, you guys can text me at any time. Uh, indeed, remember the slide, remember the estrogen criteria, remember the balance criteria, that is all. And thank you so much for listening to me. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please give me a feedback if you need any more things to be done. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much.